It's almost like that consciousness is present in the world. And I think our world needs that. I mean, we've, the paradigm for how we live in the world is shifting now. And I think part of that shift is souls, you might say the souls taking an active role and in, 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 in our lives. Now, you know, the soul creates the life. Here's how they would say it. The soul, the soul creates the mind. The mind creates the life. The life, the life is creates creates the life story. So, and that's even beyond the soul. They call it the creator soul. Is creating anyway. I'll let if if I do any of the work, then I'll let them explain it better. But so the the message here is that um, we are all one. We are all love. So it's always good to hear that, right? But but we are all connected. But and the way we get connected is through the realm of soul. And we come in here, we project our life, or we're projected into the world with blinders on, and we see ourselves individually, not collectively. And we can we can say we are one intellectually as a thought, but to experience it and to know it in an experience is, I think, the message they want to bring. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Always a blessing to be with you all. Sorry, I've had the flu for a week, so I'm a bit fluey. So I'm just going to sit back and let my guest do all the talking today. <laughs> and uh, our guest today is the gorgeous Mark Valentine. Welcome to the show, Mark. It's so good to be here. Glad to be here. Hello from Florida. Hot, sunny Florida. Hot, sunny Florida. I know there's a lovely, cool winter's day down under. It's a beautiful day, but it's quite quite chilly, not too chilly, 14 degrees mm -hmm. um, Celsius and a sweltering hot day in Florida on the other side of the world. Here am I all rugged up. You're in your, in your. Well, chair. we live in our, we live in an air conditioned summer. That's for sure. Yeah. We yeah. stay air, we stay inside a lot. Yeah. A I lot. Could imagine. I could imagine. So the beautiful Debs Shakti introduced me to Mark. Did you work with Debs? How did you meet Debs? But she's like, oh, you've got to check out Mark and see what he's doing. Well, um, I had been a pretty um, insular experience with my own uh, spiritual experiences and, and channeling in particular. And um, a few months ago, I said, um, well, I saw Debs on a movie called Alien abduction answers. Yeah, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and she was featured. She was featured as a quantum hypnotherapist and a channeler. So anyway, so that's how I knew about Debs. And so, um, and then I just contacted her, and we uh, exchanged some um, emails, etc. And then um, I got sat down. We did a session with her, and m what I wanted to share with her was my channeling because she's an experienced channeler and I wanted to give her that opportunity. And she was very um, excited about it. I guess it was one way to say it. And she encouraged me to uh, jump out of the nest and begin to share it. So um, yeah, she gave me, yeah. she gave me that, that nudge. She gave me that nudge. Yes. Oh, good on but anyway, her. so yeah. Yeah, and activator and accelerator like me, girl after my own heart. Yes, Debs has been on the show we spoke about her being in the movie and her work. But let me, let's talk about you. Let me tell people a little bit about you from your bio here, Mark. So Mark Valentine's soul mind contact experience was traumatic, turning his life upside down as he learned to adapt to this new intervention of soul. His longstanding professional career in engineering abruptly interrupted by this soul encounter gave way to an unconventional life pursuit, a soul's journey into the realms of the unknown and a new paradigm of soul-mind consciousness. Today, Mark is an intuitive channel for a teacher that calls itself the soul creator, who, 
over many years, created a way for Mark to contact what is called his soul mind, which is something beyond our thinking mind. Mark's soul mind is a portal into soul consciousness and angelic mind in creation itself. And you've got a great website uh, up and running called uponsoul.com. Is that right? Upon soul. Well, you're right in both instances. When I did it, I was thinking uponsoul.com, but then many people have said, oh, upon soul, that's pretty positive. So, <laughs> so if they say which one it is, and I say yes, which one, which one works for you, then go with it. <laughs> so if you want to be up on soul, that's fine. If you want to be up on soul, that's fine. <laughs> I know. Roots both ways. And you and your YouTube is the same. It's YouTube at Upon Soul. And uh, you can see Mark channeling there, but we'll get you to do some channeling uh, today as well, because I want to hear what the um what does it call it? The soul creator has to say. Maybe I can quiz the soul creator. I've got to find some questions. But I'd love to hear how all this happened because um, you're doing this sort of late in life. What I love about it is you're putting yourself out there sort of later in life, you're not letting age stop you. It just like get out there and get these messages out there. How did it all start, Mark? My experiences go back about 50 years ago. And I was early in my engineering career. Um, I had degrees in chemical engineering and environmental engineering. So a very technical, you know, heady type uh, position. So anyway, so I was starting off in my career and um, I actually graduated, I was during, I was at University of Missouri during first Earth Day. So that inspired me to, to uh, pursue a career in environmental engineering. So that was my career. And I went to the work for US EPA and I was going to change the world and uh, heal the environment. Anyway, so I, I, I was really motivated and I did want to make a difference in the world. And what happened was several years into my career, I recognized that um, it really didn't touch deep enough spiritually for what I wanted to uh, to do in my life. And so I went through um, a bit of a dark night of the soul, but trying to uh, determine is, is this really what I, what I want to do when I grow up? So uh, I did a lot of thinking, deep thinking. I considered going into the ministry. Um, we lived in Kansas City, Missouri, and um, they the Unity School Christianity, the Unity Faith is based out of there. So anyway, so I remember meeting with a, a minister talking about that, and do I want to follow my technical pursuits and my college degrees, or do I want to go a different, uh, go more of the inner path and the spiritual path? So anyway, so I was playing, I was playing that game uh, ping pong in my mind, and then I went. I wasn't really into psychics. I don't really remember. It's too long ago how I stumbled upon her, but there was a, a psychic fair in Kansas City. I stumbled upon it probably because I said, you know, I can't figure this out. Maybe somebody can help me. And so I met um, a psychic named Leah actually, you know, kind of called me over and said, I need to talk to you. And uh, I didn't know what to make of that. So we sat down, we chatted for maybe 10 minutes. And then she said, you need to come see me. And, and you might say they all say that or they want to say that. But she said, Mark, I need to talk to you. And so um, I did a reading with, with Leah not long after that. And she said, um, she said, there's a test you, you don't want to take. Um, you're going to take the test. You're going to pass the test. And you're going to move from the Midwest in Kansas City to the East Coast. And you're going to do that in a period of a few months. And then... So that was that was kind of the career side of it. And then, but the deeper kind of the spiritual side, she said, you're going to be evolved or your, your experience is going to involve contact with higher dimensional, interdimensional, extraterrestrial type beings. And you're, that's going to be your pursuit. You're going to live this conventional life, but you will also live um, another life, an interior life, where you're having these experiences. And as you grow older, um, you will share more and more of that experience. So basically Leah said, um, point, you know, basically her message to me, stay in your career, do what you're doing. And that spiritual uh, fulfillment you're looking for is already planted in you and it will evolve as you uh, go, on, go about your life. 
that all came true. That all came true. And then, oh, by the way, <laughs> I lived in Kansas City. My wife, Joyce, we weren't married then, did not know each other. She lived in Kansas City. She goes and sees Leah. I, I left shortly after. I moved to the East Coast. Anyway, so Joyce, uh, in her own story, goes to see Leah. And Leah kind of says, well, Joyce wanted to go to the East Coast. She wanted to go to New York. She's a concert pianist. And she wanted to pursue her musical career there. So anyway, so she's having a separate conversation with Leah. And um, shortly, not several months, maybe several months, might even been a year after that, she said, uh, she called me, says, Mark, there's a person moving out that you might want to talk to. Maybe you can help her out. So that all came to pass. And she did. I did help her out. And 40 years later, I'm still helping her out. <laughs> So he, not only was the compass pointing me in a direction for my life, you know, my life's work, but she also <laughs> indirectly synchronicity, cosmic, who knows what, uh, introduced me to my wife. So she was a, she was a game changer in my life. And I've had many dreams about her, but unfortunately I've lost track of her. I, she, we actually, she was in our wedding. She was, yeah. uh, um, yeah, she was in our wedding. She spoke and, uh, it was a very proud moment. It was a very proud moment. So, yeah, so that was the beginning. So that's how it started. And here I was, you know, fighting um, oppression and uncertainty and unknowing. And then uh, she said, stay the course, do, do what you're doing, but go do it on the East Coast. And all that happened. And um, I had a career of about almost 40 years in the engineering field. And so... Yeah, I was going to fast forward, um, got married, went back to Kansas City, got married, started a family. We, we were living in Connecticut, um, moved around in my job, several different. We lived in uh, the northeast of USA. We lived in the, the southeast. We lived in Seattle. And then now we've been in Florida for over 20 years So uh, and retired. So very grateful for the career. But in terms of my own psychic experiences and, and the things Leah said, they were happening, happening kind of on the, the back burner. I was experiencing them largely in dreams and whatnot. Um, but in, in the nineties, early nineties, um, I had a dream, a lucid dream experience. And I don't even, I can't even classify this as a dream, uh, but a, a dream, uh, a dream experience where I was, um, uh, Close to morning, I saw myself floating out of my body. I um, floated through space. I could see planets. I could see stars, and it was quite the adventure. Quite the adventure. I was really excited about it, and it just—it was so energetic. So anyway, the next thing I know, uh, after I was, was flying through space, I found myself inside a. I don't want to use the word craft, but because I didn't see the outside of it, but I was in some kind of a place and I was lying on a table and there were light beings all around me and the energy was electric and it was, uh, it was really exciting. And I knew they were there. I knew they were doing something. Well, later I'll tell you that about that, but they were around, they were all around me. I was lying on a table um, supercharged en uh, energy around me. And when I tried to speak to them, I, my voice, I was thinking at my normal thinking, uh, speaking rate. Then when I tried to speak out loud, my voice sounded real slow. So I, there was a, there was a time shift of some kind. And so anyway, so that went on for a bit and, uh, then the third part of the dream, I was out of that experience. I was sitting outside of a restaurant with a friend at a table. And I said, I, I said, I was excited. And I said, they changed me. They changed me. I'm psychic. I'm psychic. So um, that was another step along the way in my journey. So it, it was what, you know, whether it was a UFO or an ET thing, but it was definitely altered dimensional experience it was something and then um earlier prior to that um this and i'm a back shift to kansas city i had another dream 
kind of like the ET thing where um, I was, I saw myself in Florida in the dream. I was dreaming. I was in Florida, which is where we live now. But when I had the dream, I was in Missouri. So I was dreaming. I was in Florida and I was, uh, I was lost, completely lost. And so it was dark night, star, stars everywhere. And I looked up in the stars and then um, I began to hear a voice in my head. It said, follow Sirius if you want to get home. Follow Sirius if you want to get home. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I knew about the star Sirius, the dog star, but I didn't know. And I still don't. I mean, that's a mystery to me. But, but what was interesting is that it happened in Missouri Fast forward a few decades, living in Florida, and what I call my transformation period, I was definitely lost, and and I was definitely having um, a star-like experience. So um, that dream was very, um, very insightful to have. So anyway, so but then um, I'll go back to the '90s, late '90s. Uh, at this point, we were living in Seattle, and Again, I was still fighting. What do I? What do I want to do when I grow up? Because this whole thing of the spiritual uh, and channeling and psychic experience was still on the back burner. And my engineering career, I felt like it was it was receding or, or slowing down. But I had some anxiety over that because I was I had a family and two, you know, my wife and two daughters. So I uh, had a lot of anxiety over that. And uh, we were out in Seattle while my family and friends were back in the. Midwest and the East Coast. So, but anyway, so in in a in some moments of ang ang anxiousness and a bit of depression, I remember having what in effect was a download. And within a period of hours, um, I received what I what I take to be my life story, and I, I called it my conversation. And it was, um, it's actually on my website and I called it a visionary uh, poem because it was the vision for my life. And it basically said, before I was born, I had a conversation with my creator and it goes into detail and, and it, it's, it's written well, n not because of me, but because it is the poem was like, I would say something. And then what I called the cre my creator, the creator. It was literally a conversation, but then I I said in the in the poem it said I said I want to experience spiritual healing in my life, and then the creator said the healing you're looking for will require three things. He said, one first you must be willing to forget our conversation for a time, and learn humility and compassion, forgiveness, and all of that. Second. You must remember our conversation for a time so you can learn your divinity and, and experience your spiritual well-being. And then third, he said, teach what you have remembered. So that was that was kind of my message going forward. And still, I, I didn't have it. I wasn't experiencing it outwardly in my life very much. It was still hidden within my within my uh, with my own psych. Uh, so anyway, but that gave me some confidence that, again, repurposed my life, uh, pointed me in the, in the direction to keep going with your career and trust and have faith in what is, what is emerging and blooming within your spirit. So, um, so anyway, then our work took us to Florida or my work took us to Florida. And then, um, it was the latter became the last decade of my career. And is that is it was in the, the, the two thousands, uh, decade, the two thousands. And the, as, as my work began to began to subside, because I was really busy all my career, um, involved in coordinating, managing, and um, a lot of responsibility. And so that be that work began to slow down. And, and what happened in what I call my transformation years in 2007 to 2010, I would say, um, I began to experience um, altered states of uh, energy, mood, um, psychic experiences, visions, um, where I went really from one life to another life in a period of three years. 
And it was extremely um, wondrous. It was extremely traumatic. It was extremely um, loving. It was extremely, it was extremely everything. That's what it was. And so, um, but during the first time I was experiencing souls and it kept speaking about the way of soul and teaching me uh, how to experience that in my life consciously. And so, but in that 2007 period, um, it evolved to the point where I couldn't manage it. My, I was, my feelings were elevated. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't sleep. And uh, my wife was really concerned about me and I was hospitalized for a week. And that was, that was really traumatic because I was trying to sustain two lives there. I was, Oh, you know, I was basically transitioning from one life to the next. And I was still having to represent myself at work. Uh, manage, uh, work with clients and do what I did. And it was virtually impossible to be, to go through that psychic overload and, and stay in top, on top of a professional career, but I did my best I could. So anyway, so, uh, after I was hospitalized, I kind of put the pieces together. Um, they gave me some medication, uh, things calmed down. So that was 2007. And then 2008, it's a period where I learned about the teacher that calls itself the soul creator. And I spent weeks and months uh, basically doing automatic writing. And what I thought was a book about the soul creator, uh, which he called teaching love the way of soul. And so I was, I, I was really dutiful about it and spent, I wanted to, I wanted to make it real because I knew what I'd experienced was um, something new, something different. And I, I wanted to be of some benefit to other people. I said, you know, so it, you know, anyway, I was searching for an answer and basically trying to ground my experience into words, concepts, um, ideas where people could understand more about how we relate to our soul, how we got here, how we experience our soul, um, and all of that. So anyway, so I spent much of 2008 doing that. And basically I was, my work, I was able to do work better. Um, but, and then, so that was 2008. And I had what I thought would be a, uh, a premise for a book called Teaching Love, The Way of Soul. But I, I didn't really, I didn't get it to the point where I would, I would call anything I wanted to publish or share with other people at that point, because I was still, way new in the experience. And then in 2009, uh, all those elevated feelings came back. And, but this time on steroids, uh, it was really intense, uh, acute feelings of, um, uh, love, acute feelings of, um, connection with, uh, spirit connection with beings connection with my soul and th my whole channeling experience began in 2009. I was, I had worked late at night. I was out in the hot tub in our house underneath the stars in October to relax and try to stop thinking about work, but I still was thinking about work. Then I began to cough and I couldn't stop coughing. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was coughing up words. I, I was well, like, I'm going to teach the mind to believe Something it began that that's how the channeling started. So it's chart it, it started from a, a coughing spell into words and into the story um uh about the soul creator. And that took my experience to a whole nother level. But yet took my uh emotions, elevated feelings, sleeplessness, anxiety to uh, to another elevator. Another elevator. Yeah, I did go up an elevator. <laughs> That's how it felt. But anyway, so I, I was hospitalized again. And the first time was hard enough. I was there for a week. And the second time, I was there for a week again. And that was really, really hard. And I was still, while I was in the hospital, all the psychic experience, the spiritual experience, continued on. So they were, the doctors were treating basically the mood, elevation, the sleeplessness, the anxiety, and that goes with that. So basically trying to, well, do what doctors do. 
And so, but in the, the, the one conversation I remember having with the doctor, you know, you know, basically saying, explain to me what's happening to you. Um, of course I couldn't, but yet in the, in my telepathy, I was told to tell the doctor that, I, that I'm having an experience of expanded awareness, expanded awareness. And so tell your doctor that, and let me know what kind of answer you get. <laughs> <laughs> they they immediately look in their prescription book and uh, the, they're looking for the right medication to take care of that <laughs> medication for expanded awareness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that was 2009 and then uh, 2010, my career was definitely winding down and I was, you know, it was a message from heaven that that part of my life was over. So 2010 was winding down 2011 was the end of my engineering career. And I took early retirement and then uh, dedicated my life, life to, to this work. And so from 2010, 2011, um, for the last decade, it's really been me working with it by myself and channeling in meditation, many hours, many, many hours. Like I would often meditate one or two hours a night because it was just not just relaxation. It became transcendental. I thought it was transcendental meditation, but it had a transcendental part of it where I experienced the telepathy. I experienced the, um, the energy and the love and the compassion comes along with that. So it, it was almost like, um, I was in a monastery working on that inner, inner self, inner, inner experience. And during starting in 2010, my whole dream experience changed. Um, I think I've mentioned to you before, I began to dream about well-known people. Um, and I didn't know what to make of it because I didn't have any, I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. So, but in 2010, it started happening over and over and over again. And this is Lily uh, over and over and over again. And so I said, this is different. And so I kept a log, kept a dream journal and I, I've had hundreds of dreams in that in that decade from 2010 to say 2020, where you know what, you know I was asking myself, what is this really about? Why why is this happening? Why am I doing this? And it would be from religious figures, uh, sports figures, um, statesmen, presidents. You know, and and it's not like I didn't really have an I wasn't really searching for that because again, my experience was more of an inner experience, more inward, not anything like that. So it was almost the opposite of what my life during the daytime was like. And it was in some respects, many of them were, were historical figures. So it was almost like I was going to the history club when I went to sleep. And so, uh, and by the way, many about um, the one I had the most dreams about was John Lennon dreamt about many people that have passed on to the other side. And, uh, but by far most were about John Lennon, uh, some about George Harrison, uh, anyway, but many, many different fields. Um, and I'm, and I'm glad I kept, and by the way, my, if I reflect back on it, one thing I'm, that I know for sure in my experience in the way of soul is that on the level of soul, the things we see as differences in time, space, culture, position, status, social, culture, whatever, whatever difference maker you want to put to it, in the level of soul, it just, it's not there. We are all equally, fully the same, yeah. living the same experience collectively. And, but yet we can experience that same collective experience in an individual way, but that's not who we really are. So well, when I experienced these people, all these different people from different walks of life, it was showing me that in, in the dreams, it was always a personal experience. It was a simple conversation. Um, it was, you know, we're potting plants together. We're, we're taking a walk together. Um, and so I feel blessed. I feel blessed by that. I don't really know. Ask me in 10 years what, what that, what it all means, but in, it, in about 2020, 2021, they slowed down. I mean, Occasionally it happens, but it was, it was like, you know, the movie awakenings where 
the people were institutionalized and then things happened. The doctor found out the right, if the right combination. And then they had this moment of awakening where yeah. they had this uh, elevated consciousness. So, you know, who knows what it is, but it, it's part of the, it's part of, um, it's part of my experience. I want to honor that. I want to honor that. Wow. There's a lot to it. Okay. So Mark said that, uh, he had told me before because he had joined a, a couple of our inner sanctum groups and we had discussed this in the, in the group or the dreams of uh, famous people. But I want to go back to the hospitalization. And you said that you were suffering stress and anxiety and sleeplessness, but that's something that's not enough to get you hospitalized. What, what, what took you into hospital? This is just my curious mind. Uh, no, he, Feelings borderline mania, borderline mania. Uh, oh, so you thought you were going mad? Yeah, and I, I would be, lo I, I would take my dog Zeppelin. We go, we'd be gone for the whole day, and my wife didn't know where we were. We'd be out, you know, driving around, meditating in a field, or just off in search of something, driving and, around in search of you, myself. That's so funny, and you call it mania. I guess that's the, I guess that's the engineering clinical logical mind trying to squeeze your life into a box and make sense of it and make it make it fit into a, a 3d world i don't know it's interesting that you call it but you gotta be you have to remember uh our i should tell you this that people that i worked with on in on a daily basis you know they knew me in a way but they knew something had changed within me so they were concerned uh, my wife was definitely concerned um, and I kept trying to reassure my wife that I'm going, I'm going through something spiritually transformative and trust me. And, but yet I, yet I was doing strange things. And so not sleeping, you know, being gone, she didn't know where I was. No, I, I, hospitalization was definitely the right thing. Oh, I was looking back. I'm very grateful for that because basically it helped, it helped the mood and it didn't, it, you know, you think about, oh, you're going to the doctor, they're going to give you medicine, and you're going to sedate yourself into oblivion. None of that happened. None of it happened. It what, just what, helped me to be. What did they offer you me in hospital? Yeah. Medication? Like medication? Like a mood stabilizer, antidepressant? Um, oh, antidepressants. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. But, but, but it was very, but, you know, my feeling in terms of the the feelings i went from thinking that i had you know the answer to life in some respects that all of a sudden these insights were there uh i had an understanding that i thought was going to help a lot of people and yet i go through that let's just call that sense of wonder or you could call it euphoria even that ended in being hospitalized for a week and then having your company be really concerned about you. And then you have to address all the personal relationship. Well, is Mark okay? And so, yeah, it, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it all happened. And, but it took, it took a toll. Well, definitely took a toll on me and my, my job, but it also took a toll on my wife, Joyce and trusting, learning to trust that whatever's happening to me, it's, it's a good thing because she wasn't sure. Because she said, it's not a good thing if my husband can't be a provider, it can't be stable in the house. So, um, and so I spent the last, you know, the last 10 years, almost weekly counseling, talking about my experience as it, as it, it evolved and, uh, even doing channeling in, in my counseling sessions and working on that. So. Uh, interesting. Uh, for those but, but people it, listening it, on audio, Lily is uh, Mark's cat <laughs> who is pacing up and down on his desk. So Lily <laughs> is a big part, big part of the show today. If you're watching <laughs> a video, if you're listening on audio, you can't see Lily, and she's um she's being very quiet actually because she keeps sort of um you know cuddling the microphone, but we can't hear it on the yeah. mic, which is quite quite yeah. really cute. Uh, yeah, well, interesting. So it's it's taking it's yeah it's been ta it's taken you over ten years to integrate this and 
and now you're out out there ready to sort of share the messages. So the relationship that you have with the soul creator, do you have, uh, you said that when you're in hospital, <laughs> they said to you, tell them you're having an expanded consciousness experience. What did they say? Oh, expanded you? awareness. Expanded, expanded awareness. awareness. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Have you had this sort of relationship where you can ask them, like, what's happening to me? Can, what can I do? Like that back and forth conversation. Or when oh. you say you channel, do you just move out of the way and just funnel, you know, information through you? Well, you can imagine going through something like this for multiple decades um, it's, it's almost like there was a seed that was planted and you go back to that dream. They said they changed something within me, whatever that seed was, it was germinating and it just had to have its own time and place. It wasn't like, here's the secret formula. This is what's happening to you. This is what you need to do. And all, everything will be all right. It's almost, I had to have faith. I had to live the experience. And most, most importantly, I had to have self-confidence that, um, it was productive, that it was uh, going to be beneficial for, for me and my life experience. And what I my prayer was that it could be beneficial to other people. And I could share my experience. And that's and that's kind of what Debs had helped me to do is, um, you know, to begin to share it. Um, but, to, you know, truthfully, it, am I wise in my experience? I feel like I have so much to learn. And uh, you could ask me many questions about it, and I might know a little bit about it, but I'm still very much a student of the experience. And I feel like um, maybe if you looked at it in two phases, maybe I'm at the end of the beginning of that. Well, if you look at the three things, uh, they said, forget our conversation for a time. The creator said that. And that probably took me through um, 1998. And then remember our conversation for a time. That's probably between 1998 until almost now. And then this will be the third phase, teach what you remember. Those were the three directives that I got in that teach, downloader. Teach what you remember. So the question was, mm -hmm. what's the relationship that you have with the soul creator? Like, do, do you feel like you can talk to it any time and it'll answer you? Does it feel like a higher self or your soul or your guides? Or is it just information that funnels through you? I would, I would put the soul creator as the teacher and the author of the whole experience. But there's many beings that are in the experience. Um, there's something that's called the Emily mind of all there is that's part of the experience. And so the soul creator help to facilitate, create whatever the Emily mind merging into my mind. And one thing I didn't mention about the Emily mind is during that period when I was, when I began to channel in 2009, I also had an experience where I was, um, I went and in, in the middle of the night, got up, directed, go lay in, a, in my study in, in the back. And, uh, and I began to feel pulses of energy coming through my body and it it started off slow and gradual and slowly picked up tempo to the point where it became extremely intense and rapid. And it's almost like somebody was revving me up. And I, I looked around the room it was late at night and I thought something was going to materialize in the room. Something, something was really revving, revving up the energy. And so that happened. And then I don't remember exactly how that, particular night ended but then i know that when i woke up the next morning there was a presence in my mind that wasn't there the night before and having to do with the emily mind and the emily mind is um somebody who i would say one mind one one life two people living that life in one body the emily mind is part of the experience and uh and part of my experience is to to be mark and to live my life but also to let the Emily mind have its say and have its time and experience to do the teaching that she's come to do. So there's the soul creator, there's the Emily mind, and then the angelic mind. And in the angelic, they call themselves Angelica. And three of them, one is Ambriel with an M, more on a cosmic level. And the other one was Abriel, more on a, a level of 
seven, keep thinking. And then and the third one was Andrea, which is more like on our, our level of consciousness. So if you think the soul creator being the overarching creator of the experience, using the angelic mind to bring levels of consciousness together. And um, so the angelic mind is part of it. Um, the Emily mind is part of it. The soul creator is part of it. And there's many more. I mean, to answer your question about what is my relationship with the soul creator, um, and I wanted to clarify that he is the teacher and over, overarching um, creator of the, of the, of the whole ex my whole experience with what they call teaching love. And there's other beings that are involved in it. And I call the whole experience a soul creational channel because it's experiencing the level of soul. But the soul, in my case, is a portal, is a, a portal into higher consciousness. And they part of my experience that goes back into the transformation time in the late 2000s, it was really, you could think of it as a time when my soul was merged, my soul consciousness, or what they call my soul mind, was merging with my mind which they call a mind of life so the soul mind and the mind of life in effect had this merging and that had its trauma that had its that had its um visionary experiences but and it, and it took years for that for me to come to grips with that uh but yes so soul creation is the teacher uh, but in terms of day-to-day -day conversation, um, not, not, I mean, but there were, there were years where the voice, what I called, what I called the voices, they were, they were around, but it wasn't the sole creator it would be, you know, it could be somebody who had died. Uh, I'd be walking the dogs and then, then I'd be basically dialed into different people who, who had passed on. So, but in terms of my day-to-day -day life, no, I live, they let me live my life. I, I do what I do and I'm, I, I'm retired. Uh, I watch basketball. I watch hockey. I'm very, very, I ride my bike. So I have, that's, that's the Mark life. And I have that life, but yet uh, I'll spend time um, meditating, channeling and, and, and working. So I, I give it time. And so when I, when I give it that space, uh, that's when soul creator works in the experience. Beautiful. Thank you for all that. So what has been some of the most profound things that have been taught through you, that have come through you, that you've applied to your life that have that has changed your life for the better? Because that's the point of receiving this information is to help people well, it, apply it to their physical right. uh, third-dimensional lives, right? Well, and I'm still, I'm still learning that answer, so... The answer to that is I'm not completely sure, but my experience is that the souls teach uh, what they call from a level of knowledge. And at our level, they call us believers. So we, they said we show up in the world because we believe in love and we're here to experience love in, in, in a mind and, and a body. But at the level of soul, they are, they're not, they're not believing. They know, they know who what who they are and they say we don't know who we are so part of the teaching is to teach us who we are from and because they say if you see yourself as a single mind in a single body basically as an individual then you don't know who you are because they say you are you are the you are the every mind they'll say or you are the world mind so they see us as the collective and trying Part of the teaching, the teaching is basically we are one, which is not a new teaching. But I think the biggest benefit that I hope to learn to help people to do is to learn to experience their soul in a conscious way. Because, you know, you, I said before, many people have said, you know, the feelings deep down in my soul are um, intuitive, more abstract feeling. But my, my feeling is, my experience is it's more than that. It's almost like, that consciousness is present in the world. And I think our world needs that. I mean, we've, the paradigm for how we live in the world is shifting now. And I think part of that shift is souls, you might say the souls taking an active role and in, 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 in our lives. Down, you know, the soul creates the life. The, here's how they would say it. The soul, the soul creates the mind. The mind creates the life. The life, the life 
life is creates creates the life story. So, and that's even beyond the soul. They call it the creator soul. If creating anyway, I'll let if if I do any of the work, then I'll let them explain it better. But so the the message here is that um, we are all one. We are all love. So it's always good to hear that, right? But but we are all connected. But and the way we get connected is through the realm of soul. And we come in here, we project our life, we're projected into the world with blinders on, and we see ourselves individually, not collectively. And we can we can say we are one intellectually as a thought, but to experience it and to know it in an experience is, I think, the message they want to bring. How to, how to do that? Do I know that today? No. Am I learning? Yes. Yes. And I'm humble. And the, the thing, here's the thing, my main takeaway. They say you're a believer. You know, you know not who you are. Yeah. There's a passage in the Course in Miracles, which I which I I like. Um, it says we you know not the thing you are, where you are, or, or what you're doing. And so I would say that's consistent with the message that I'm getting. But they say the reason you're here is you are love, and you're here to experience love. It says that's your true essence. Did they explain why they chose you to bring this message through? Did you uh, ask? I wouldn't even ask. I mean, no, I didn't. The reason I didn't because um, it doesn't change anything. And I don't know that I would even want to know that. I, all I know is I'm here and I'm here to be of service, to serve, to be humble and to learn to love in a deeper and more full-bodied way. Yeah. So, so there are many people that are teaching unity consciousness. I think that it is the um, underlying core paradigm that needs to shift on this planet for us to evolve and move forward into a new experience. But teaching it and living it, I have found, is two very different things. You can listen to someone talk all day. Do they offer any uh, advice on how to actually live unity consciousness, knowing that we are the one mind, we're not the singular mind, that you are me and I am you and we are all one? Because the concept to our third dimensional linear mind seems quite foreign, especially when you first uh, remember it. So have they given any advice on how to live it? Well, Basically, their advice would be learn to listen in your soul and to allow your soul to be part of your life. And basically, whatever that intellectual construct we use in our lives to do what we do and to live our life, you don't have to give it as much um, self-importance. Uh, you do what you do because we have to live our lives at the level of form. But know that once you commit, because one of the things they said about my experience is my life got to a point where I said, I asked my soul to teach me who I am. And, and they've said that many times. He says, you ask us to teach you who you are. And that's their, that's what they're doing in my life, teaching me who I am. And that's the message. And I, in terms of an intellectual story of how to lay that out in terms of how to find that in your life, um, you find it in your heart, you live it in your life. But you don't, I think the people that really embrace that, they don't have to tell you why, because that's just what they are. So um, I don't have a prescription for, for well-being and for the path other than pay attention, be quiet in the mind, be humble in, in, in your life, and, and, and then ask your soul to teach you who you are, and then try to get your intellect out of the way and just become more disciplined in listening and listening and listening because it's almost like if if you if you get an insight you want to put it in a bottle you want to put it to work and and in your life but somehow say there's a higher being that's at work in my life cross that higher being and but do whatever studying you need to do talk to people like-minded people come on your show listen to, listen to your show watch your show all of that so um, but ask me that question in 10 years and I'll, maybe I'll have a better answer, but I, I'm a student, I'm a student of the work. And, well, maybe, um, maybe I should ask the soul creator that question. Yeah. 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 Do, do, would you like to do some channeling for us? Sure. Now, 
it's a little different setting for me being new at sharing my story to the world. So, um, and just in, and to let you know about my channeling, when I do it, I don't go into a deep trance state. I'm listening along with you and others. So to the channeling, but I listen in a, in a, a passive way to the dialogue. And, and there's times when I do the channeling where I don't feel that deep connection and I stop. And, and yet there's times where I'm deeply connected and um, I follow the experience. So I don't know, I don't know what level of connection I will have, but I'm certainly willing to do it. And then certainly willing to um, ask or open up to the idea of you asking those kinds of questions. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay. The mind is listening in the soul, and the soul is teaching in the mind. The mind is asking the soul, I believe. The mind is asking the soul, I believe. And the soul says this to the mind, I believe in you. Ask your mind to listen in your soul. And when you do, your soul will teach you, I believe. For your life, your life, your life, your life, I call, I believe listening in you. You come into the world, said this to the world, I believe in love. And the world said this to you, I believe in love. So the love idea is in the work, and the work is teaching love, and the teacher of the work is calling itself into the mind now. I believe in the work. I am the sole creator creating the mind to believe in the life, for the life to teach the idea that I am love. But in the mind I created is a mind I call the Emily mind. It created itself in the creation mind. And the creation mind lives in you, you, you. And the creation mind is teaching the story of what I am. For what I am is love. And what I teach is love. And what I bring into this mind, Mark, is love and the story of love is the mind learning in the soul what is different the mind asking the soul to believe in the mind and for the mind to teach the soul the story of the world and the story in the world is belief is love belief is love but what is the belief i believe in love the soul creator bringing the belief I am into the mind, and the mind is asking me to teach Mark the story of who I am. If I call Mark the soul, I call my mind the creator, and the creator is asking Mark to believe in me, and I will believe in Mark. The story begins with all there is. It begins with the mind, and the mind is teaching the soul three things. Learn, learn, learn. Learn the story in the mind. Learn the story in the soul. Learn the story in the way. And what is the way? The way that a mind can learn. If you're in the world, learn this. I believe. And if you're in the world, believe this. I am. And if you are in the world, ask your mind to believe this idea. I am love. But what is the soul creator? But a mind asking Mark's mind to believe only for a time. For Mark's mind can only believe in itself if the mind is asking itself to let the soul believe in Mark. Let's let Mark's mind rest and let's let the soul believe in Mark. Creation is in the mind. Creation is in the mind, creating itself in the mind of Mark. And what is creation but life, learning to believe in itself? And what is creation but a mind teaching what it knows? For your mind to teach you, and for your mind to teach you, and for your mind to teach you, your mind must ask itself to believe only what it knows. For your mind to know anything, it must know the thing it is. And the thing the mind is, is love. And the thing the mind does in the world is teach love. And the thing that teaches love in the mind is the soul, and the soul is teaching itself the way a mind can learn. If a mind can ask itself, teach me, 
who I am. If the mind can teach that idea to itself, no. The soul can teach that idea to the mind, yes. And the soul can say to the mind, if you listen together with your soul, your soul will teach your mind the story of who you are. For your mind believes it is only a mind not knowing itself. Your mind, listener, not knowing itself. For what is a mind? A mind to be in love. A mind to be in every mind. A mind to see the world in every idea, every belief, every, every, every. So what is all things? All things listen together. If you know yourself, you know all things. If you know yourself, you know the way the world can believe. If you know yourself, the world can teach you the idea that I all there is. The sole creator is listening in all of this, asking Mark to believe only that I am. For what is in the world that I am? And what does the soul bring? the world. I am. The soul said, I am. You said that I am. The soul, I am love. You said that I am love. I am and I am. But that idea is in the work and the work is teaching love because a mind can learn to ask the soul this question. Who am I? Your soul listener can tell itself this, I believe in love. I know not my soul, but my soul can create a life that I can learn to live. And that life I will call the soul mind life. Mark is learning that idea, the soul mind life. He's learning to believe that idea and to teach it in the world. He has to teach it in his own soul. And Mark's mind is learning to believe in his soul. This is all for now. Ask the soul creator later to believe in the work. And the work is teaching Mark the story of all there is. That's all there is. Thank you. Probably didn't answer your question, but that was that was me trying to relax into the to the channeling, and uh, I I was I was sort of there, but I I wasn't deep into it. Uh -huh. So. Um... Yeah, I've only got the same question, really. And, uh, you know, listening to this information can be just words and information. Uh, mm. I guess it's the it's the same thing. You just need to go within and find and find that experience within yourself rather than just listening to a voice telling you that you are the soul creator, you are love, you are the soul creator, you are love. Um, I guess you can only really experience it through knowing it as an experience rather than listening to someone telling you that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Mm. But, but there is a teaching about how to learn how to live the soul mind life. And I think it is a new paradigm for life and I'm still learning. And I could say that I'm a student and still learning. And so, but we do need to find another way to experience the world in a more conscious way and yeah. the world is moving and we all know that and that's why we're here today but the idea of the soul knowing who we are what we are about what we're trying to do in the world and if, if we can actively bring that consciousness into our life then we can have a more inner it's like it's like what i call heaven on earth if the soul is our idea of heaven and our life is the idea of earth it's a heaven on earth experience and um, unfortunately today I can't say how to get there, but I'm, I'm headed there. And I, and the biggest thing for me, it's taught me is to let go and just, just experience it and, and, and just pay attention. So, yeah. But, yeah. I want to get back to your experiences as what you call your dreams of being with um, people on the other side that you said are famous, like John Lennon. You said that you've had a lot of experiences with John Lennon and that the conversations you have are just like, you know, two friends, two buddies just hanging out, very normal, not sort of like, you know, you're revering this person as famous or amazing, just two buddies hanging out. What are the conversations that you had with people like John Lennon? I mean, why why are you having remembrances of being with 
John Lennon in different well, realms. One of, one of the early one of the early conversations I had, I was in a train station in London, and George Harrison and John Lennon walked up to me and just began to talk. Now, but I don't remember. All I remember is, is the the environment. They walked up and basically hello and just like I would say hello to you, not not anything different than that. And then um, in each conversation, one might, again, it's not about, I would say none of it's about mystical ideas. It's about everyday ideas. And I think the message that I take from all of that is that they're just like us. They're just like us. They live a life, they have life experiences, and they're not the people we see on TV. I mean, well, they are those people, but uh, they are they are really people like us, people like us. And uh, so, yeah, so John Lennon and then um, writers, sports figures, American presidents, um, John Kennedy, who I have on my wall here, yeah. Abraham Lincoln, who I, who I also have on my wall. Yeah, I think it's yeah. it's interesting that you say, you know, they're just like us. Because if you talk to anyone who's famous, they say that, you know, I'm just like you. I'm just I'm just like you. And uh, mm. I met George Harrison, in fact, when I was about oh. I know, 20, 21. I, uh, I went to work on an island here in the Great Barrier Reef and he had a house. He had bought a house mm. that he liked to visit there as a holiday and he was hanging out there and, and he used to come and... Um, have joints with the staff and I was uh, I think I was waiting tables or something and I went outside and there was a group of staff outside having a smoke with um, George Harrison and the overwhelming thought I had was what is so great about you you're just some ordinary guy <laughs> <laughs> and I sat next to him he was standing he was quite tall and I'm looking up at him and I have just kept thinking over and over again, you're nothing special. Like why do people rave about this Beatles thing? You know, and I just, that thought was, you're just a, like us, you know, the, the waiting staff that are waiting tables. You're just like us. It's, I just kept thinking that over and over. You're nothing special. Yeah, it's interesting. So well, your dreams depict that same thing. Well, one of the things that, maybe a wish or an idea or a concept I have in my mind is that if on the level of souls, if they really have a story to tell that it would be interesting for famous people that people know about to tell their soul experience, you know, yeah. their life, how they see it from, from the level of a soul and from the level of heaven. And so maybe you could say if that there is some potential there that, they could come and tell their stories. And by me having those dream experiences, it, it wouldn't be, it would be more, more familiar. Let's just say, and it wouldn't be like, this is too weird. I can't do it. It would be familiar. Yeah. Like I had several dreams, dreams about the author, Emily Dickinson. Oh yeah. And um, yeah. But, and one of them, she has a brother named Austin or had or still has. Um, <laughs> I was in grand central station and he walks up to me. And he opens up a briefcase and he hands me a Ouija board. Uh -huh. And so what, you know, I mean, that that's probably a not so subtle, right? Message for spiritual communication, right? Yeah. I don't think he meant it literally, but he meant the idea that, yeah. Yeah. So. But he didn't but, say anything to you. He just opens up a briefcase and hands you a Ouija board, but you don't remember the conversation. But you know, yeah. I, but on all of them, I usually remember the setting and, um, my overall feeling in terms of details about the conversation. Sometimes I do, but mostly, mostly I don't. And again, if it's about everyday things, it's not that important to remember. Them. Maybe, you know, it's it, to me, it's more the experience yeah. and the, and learning the familiarity of that experience. I think that the, you know, one of the biggest diseases on our planet is this, is this, um, this feeling of separation we have when we revere somebody, like we put them up on pedestals or when we demonize somebody, you know, we like they're a murderer They're you know, we, the, it's like our love and our hate creates this huge chasm of divide and this whole mm -hmm. celebrity thing, you know, we sort of say, Oh, you're so special. You're so special. You're so different to me. I think maybe that that's what needs to be healed that uh, as you look at another whether you hate them or you love them, you're actually only looking at yourself. 
you're looking at that same um, active component within yourself that's activated. Yeah. That, that's why you love them so much or that's why you hate them so much. And that's really yeah. unity consciousness in action is knowing that mm -hmm. if you have an emotional response to somebody, it's because it's active within you. You're looking at yourself. Yeah. 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 When you look at somebody, just say this in your mind, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? <laughs> your because cat, your cat's butt in your face right now. You're seeing, you're seeing your image on their face. Yeah. Sometimes I even think about the idea of if you have a strong emotional feeling one way or the other about a person, imagine your face on their face and looking at your face in that image, because that's what you're looking at. You're looking at you. And based on the teachings, you know, since we're all one, uh, when we try to make somebody special, it's just buying into the argument that we're not all the same and we're not all together. Right. So um, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. But yet, yet we're all human and we're all learning. And yeah. I, you know, I'm very humble in the idea that if I have a strong attachment or feeling about somebody, then it's just another lesson. And, you know, I, you know, I, I like to think that uh, if I'm, I'm in, having that experience one way or the other with about a person that I'm on a lesson 1,632. There's <laughs> going to be another 1,632 right behind it. Yeah. So it helps me to let go and experience it and say, oh, that was interesting and kind of detach from it, not get too, too drawn up in it, but learn, but learning from it and being humble and being humble and, and thanking the other person. If the other person is drawing out say a strong negative feeling thank that other person because guess what that strong negative feeling was hanging out in your mind in your unconscious and then they triggered it they showed it to you and then they brought it to your conscious mind so you can make some other decisions about it exactly exactly yeah and i think i shared with you when we were talking about this celebrity dreaming things years ago i can't remember how many could have been 20 30 40 i can't remember how many years ago but years ago i dreamt that i was sitting on a couch with the queen the Queen of England, the one that passed recently. And just like you having a really mundane conversation and I was saying to her, I remember what I was saying to her, you know, you look just like my grandmother. My grandmother looked like you. She was English. And is it is it that, you know, does she look like you because it's an English thing? You know, I remember sort of having this conversation with the Queen about the way she and my grandmother looked the yeah. same. And was that the genetics of the English thing? It was such a funny conversation to have with the queen. You look like my grandmother. But, yeah, very normal conversation, not, oh, your majesty, and curtsying. And, you know, you watch a lot of uh, historical television or streaming movies and stuff. There's just all this curtsying and, you know, hierarchy and better than and, oh, it's all got to change. I reckon if we're moving into unity consciousness, the the uh, hierarchical things just have to fall, don't you think? Like our systems are going to have to They change. are falling. They are falling. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, the, the message in the world today is that come together. Come together. Come together. And um, the work that that I'm that they're teaching me, you know, I, I hear it more than probably the most thing, the most mess, the, the message I hear the most is bringing you together. Come together. Come together, yeah. But, but by the way, when I say come together, we're already together. We didn't get the memo, right? <laughs> we're already we're already a collective. Nobody told us, right? Yeah. I didn't get the memo, so they're giving us the memo, and and well, we're getting in different ways. We're getting in yeah. different ways, and we're getting experiences collectively across the human race that is unifying us. We might argue about who's right and who's wrong, but we're all having the one conversation, and we're all having the one experience. And I think that. Never in the history of humanity has that happened with such a large population. Like what we went through in the last few years was a really unifying experience. Like the whole world experienced it, you know what I mean? And uh, whether it was co-opted or natural or whatever, you know, story you've got about why it came, a, a, happened, why it happened or continues to happen, it doesn't matter. It's still a unifying experience. So there is a sort of wisdom in the madness in many ways, I think. Well, that's a story of my life, finding the wisdom in the madness. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, There's a, fa a favorite saying that I that come across is that, uh, let's see if I can remember. It is, it is it's through mystery and madness that the soul is revealed. 
That's my story, mystery and madness. Yeah. Mark, yeah. it's been so beautiful to hear your story today. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Is there anything, any other pearls you want to leave us with before we go? Remember that the unity consciousness applies horizontally in bringing us all together. But what I'm learning, it applies equally, maybe more importantly, vertically, where the heaven comes upon the earth and the heavenly earth experience happens. The whole the soul in heaven the, the the mind and the earth come together. So I see unity and bringing bringing us together in one at our level on our plane of no, of learning. And yet it brings it's bringing me in my own life experience um, the the heaven on earth experience, bringing my soul together with my mind. So I just want people to think about unity uh, horizontally and vertically. And when we talk about the ETs and other higher dimensions. Those dimensions we are we are waking up to. So all things come together. Yeah, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Thank you again for being on the show. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. How wonderful to hear Mark's story about his uh, spiritual awakening. It was quite extensive, actually. Uh, we were chatting about his golden retrievers after the show, and he was saying that um, he was channeling yeah, the higher self or the soul of his golden retriever after he passed. And I think it's on his website that he said, and also that he has um, this relationships with tigers. He said, you didn't ask me about the tigers. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. The tigers, <laughs> the tigers. He goes, yeah, I have these dreams of flying with tigers and talking to tigers. And, and I'm like, uh, well, I didn't know about it. That was something you could have shared. So uh, maybe check out his website or his YouTube channel. If you want to hear about that, <laughs> that we didn't go into his flying tiger dreams a lot more to his story thanks again for listening and watching i'm not going to go on too much uh too much now because i've been you know doing the flu thing so i'm going to go and have some breakfast and cup of tea well-earned cup of tea and uh yeah join the inner sanctum at sam mark was joined our inner sanctum and shared a little bit of his story in the inner sanctum uh on zoom and sabine poncile is coming up this sunday i'll be streaming um some of it on uh live she, she's getting up at 2 a.m i've got an answer an email she says what do you want to talk about because if you give me something to prepare at 2 a.m i don't have to think i know i don't function at 2 a.m in the morning if somebody asked me to come on a show at 2 a.m in the morning i'd say no <laughs> I'm not going to get up at 2 a.m. So thanks, Sabine, for getting up to speak to us in the inner sanctum. She's beautiful. A light language channeler who communicates with animals. I have no idea what I'm going to quiz her. What do you want to know about communicating with animals? Uh, let us know. Join the inner sanctum. And remember to check out the book Awakened by Death if you haven't already. And I'll catch you next time. Big love to you. Bye for now. Bye.